Hey guys, this is Shea Jose, and today we'll be doing something a little bit different. Uh, today I'll be taking you through my mastering chain. Now, just a little uh, prefix to this. Uh, the way I have my mastering chain is not always the same way. It depends on the project that I'm working on and the style of the song as well, whether it's a more aggressive like um, techno or progressive house or something more chill like melodic techno. Um, but anyway, so I thought I'd give you a rundown because I've had a few questions over the last month as to how I master my tracks. So we're going to the mastering process. I've done a few videos on how I actually mix my songs, but this time we'll break down the mastering process. So let's get into the video. All right, guys, so the first thing I do uh, when I start my mastering process, um, and I've been doing this a lot more probably in the last couple of tracks that I've been making, is I actually uh, am doing now a mix down of the track onto a new 24-bit 48 hertz file. And I will, I will put it into something like um, RX, uh, Isotope RX, and just uh, potentially go down here and actually do a phase rebalancing. So if you don't know how to do this, you literally just drag and drop your file in here and under the utilities plugin there is this button called phase. Now the phase alignment, what this allows you to do is you've got the positive and negative facing of each uh, side of the track. What this does is actually look at the volume changes within the track and actually realign them because this can have some adverse effects later on uh, when you start applying compression, limiting and all that sort of stuff. So this will actually give you a smoother signal and allow your compressor to work a lot better uh, throughout the project. Um, so really once you've got this inserted, the only other thing I would pretty much do in here is just hit the suggest button and it will do its thing. It usually takes about a minute or two when it's actually analyzing uh, the entire project. Uh, I won't go through this because I've already done this uh, afterwards. Uh, once it's finished, you will hit render. It will render the file and then you can export this uh, to wherever you want as a selection. I usually just export it back into the same 24-bit um, 48 hertz uh, file. And the file at this point is ready for me to start working. Okay, so over here we have a track that I'm working on. It's actually a new track uh, that I've just finished producing. It's called Heart of Glass. Um, it's not out yet, so I will give you a little bit of a preview of the track. And then we'll go into the mastering process uh, for this track. I won't really cover the mix. I might do that in a later in a later video. Uh, but definitely give you a, a, uh, a way of actually hearing what the mastering sounds like. Now, what I usually do is I usually use a reference track here as well. Um, I kind of do that towards the end, um, so we may dump another file in here of the similar sort of style and have a look to see how they compare, at least from a, a lust perspective and a balancing perspective, but that I tend to do mostly in the mix. I tend to reference tracks uh, while I'm doing the mixing process. I find that um, I can fix a lot more issues in the mix, and then the mastering chain is kind of very limited. The, I, I'm not actually doing a hell of a lot in the mastering because a lot of the, I guess, the uh, the magic is kind of done uh, within the actual mixing process of the track. So anyways, I'll let you hear the track. I've just turned the mastering chain off here, uh, but I'll let you hear what the track sounds like and then we'll go through the process. Um, the reason why I've put this at negative minus 4.5, if you're wondering, is because I have about minus 3 dB headroom uh, if I lift this at zero, but I wanted to get a little bit more headroom because I thought I could squeeze a little bit more out of the mastering um, in certain areas, uh, which we'll cover. Um, hence why I dropped the volume a little bit more, uh, just to give myself a little bit more headroom and not to push some of the dynamics as hard. All right, guys, so without any further ado, let's have a quick listen of the track without the mastering chain on. And then what we'll do is we'll cover the process and my approach, at least on this mix, as to how I got this track mastered. So here it is beforehand. So that's the track beforehand. Now let's hear it with the mastering chain and then we'll break down the process.
So that's a bit of a preview of the track. Now, uh, let me just start by saying that um, in order to get a really good master, you got to have a really good mix. Um, that old saying that you can't polish a turd uh, rings true uh, to this particular process. So if you are making a track and you're expecting your master and engineer to perform miracles and actually have your song sound fantastic, uh, to tell the truth, it's not going to happen. Even the most uh, skillful mastering engineers won't be able to make something that sounds absolutely shit sound even better uh, later on. So most of the times, a good mastering engineer will actually sit down, have a listen to your rough mix down, uh, gives you some tips on how to actually improve your mix down to be able to get a better mastering um, out of the actual mix down that you submit. So that's just a little, little bit of a tip. So don't go into the mastering process thinking that you'll be able to fix any issues in the mastering process because you won't. Um, you're just simply re-emphasizing the things that are already wrong. Um, so really what you need to do is actually go back to your mix down and actually have a look at your mix down and think about some of the choices that you have made uh, and fix them there before you actually submit the track uh, to be mastered. Okay, so without further ado, what I might do is I'll just turn all these plugins off and then we'll go through each of the individual choices, at least that I've done for this track, um, as to why um, I've gone down this route uh, for this particular track and the mastering options that I've, I've chosen. So, uh, the first thing I've done in here, um, as I explained before, is I added the track into RX just to get a face rebalanced, uh, rebalanced on the entire track and re it back into Ableton. Uh, the first thing I always do is actually raise the volume up a little bit because I've actually, uh, I like to have a lot of headroom, probably mo more than most, uh, to be able to master. Um, I tend to either drop the volume down a little bit or actually have the mix quite low. Um, and then what I do is, I, the, the first instance of my mastering chain is usually a match EQ. Now, I've already done this with another reference track um, and kind of just reference the, the, the EQ curve of what that song sounded against mine. And uh, if you don't know how to do this, you simply just put another, create another audio track in here. You would hit uh, solo this track, hit capture, it will grab the analysis of that file, and then vice versa, go back into your into your track, uh, you solo it, you, play, you press capture, and then it'll do a comparison. And then you can just simply adjust how much of that uh, EQ matching um, ozone will actually do. Um, so we won't cover that because I've already done this here. The next point that I will do in my mastering chain is actually look at problem frequency. So what I did here is actually um, look at tapering down some of that um, low end rumble. Now, you don't really need to cut everything uh, so aggressively uh, on your low end. Um, so I, I found that just using a uh, 60B slope here um, was more than fine. Um, so essentially, if we just open up uh, let's have a look here. Let's go into the drop and make sure we don't have anything else turned on. Yep, we don't. What I've done in here is actually capture a few of the frequencies, the resonating frequencies that, are, that were giving me some issues. So I've boosted up the, uh, the kick um, slightly. Um, let's have a look. It should be uh, B, which is the fundamental. Uh, that's right where the kick is actually sitting. Uh, just to give it a little, a little bit more punch, um, only about a dB or so. We've boosted the uh, the mid lows. Um, boosted this up. We could probably boost this up at around yeah, around 124, which is the second set harmonics or the, the second order harmonics here, uh, and just on the on the mid side. Just felt that it wasn't punching through hard enough. Um, so just did a 72 slope on this one and actually just raced about one dB. So as you can see, they're all very, very small tweaks. Uh, nothing is actually too much uh, on this track. Uh, finally, we've just done some dips on some of some resonant frequencies that I could find in the track. And last but not least, I basically cut anything uh, below 180 hertz, uh, all the sides under 180 hertz. So they're basically keeping that low and really mono. Um, so all together, that kind of sounds like this. 
that's one of the problem resonating frequencies so you can hear that I uh, ducked it out So essentially what I've done is just do some little EQ cuts in here. Like I said, they're not very aggressive. We're only talking about half a dB, you know, not even a dB on some of them. Um, very, very small um, EQ cuts. Because as I said before, this is kind of like broad strokes within the mastering process. I tend to do a lot of the fixing of my tracks within the mixing process now. Um, so the mastering process becomes quite easy. It's about really just kind of polishing it giving it, you know, giving it a little bit more stereo width um, and just kind of working with what I have. Um, so if we move on to the next plugin, um, I ended up using here a Ozone Imager, uh, basically just to give a little bit more stereo width. So what I've done is I've, uh, I've break this up into four bands. So you've got the low band, which is completely mono, anything above 200 here. So pretty much doing what the EQ was. Um, we've got the uh, low mids, which I've just boosting slightly. I think it's only about 13%. Uh, then the higher frequency ranges, a little bit higher uh, and a little bit higher again. So uh, this is just to basically give the mix, oh, excuse me, the mix a little bit more width, uh, keeping the low end really mono and actually opening up the stereo uh, band a little bit more in the upper frequencies. So we'll let you hear how each one of these ones sound uh, and then we'll go through the process. So, so as you can hear this, they're the the uh, low end is quite mono, very straight, <laughs> no phasing whatsoever. And that's kind of what you want, especially for club music. And then we go into the low mids. A little bit stereo, but still no phasing whatsoever, which is great. We move into the higher uh, harmonic range. Still quite good. No face correlation there. And then finally the higher frequency. So that's what we're doing. Just opening up the, the mix a little bit up in uh, in the stereo width. Uh, the next plugin that I got in the line, as you can see, I really like the uh, Ozone uh, Mastering Suite. Uh, Fat Filter, Ozone uh, are pretty much my go-to. I use some T-Rex stuff as well, um, mostly the Clipper. Uh, but that's mostly in the um, mixing stage. Um, but anyway, so we'll move on. So what I'm doing here, I'm using some multi-bag compressing. Um, what I've done here was a little bit different is I'm actually just compressing the mids um, and leaving the sides quite open, so quite floppy. You will actually hear the stereo sound. Uh, it sounds it's quite lively uh, compared to the, the mid. Um, the reason why I've done this is I wanted to actually have the mid really nice and tight um, uh, in the in the overall sound that I was going for this, while I want to have the stereo kind of very loose and and vibey and life, uh, that, so that you could actually hear this uh, the juxtaposition of each one of the compression between the middle uh, or the mid signal and the side signal. So similar to what we did before, we're just breaking up this up into four bands. So we've got the lows here. Um, we'll just solo that. And we're not doing a hell of a lot of compression here. Um, we're only getting about one to two dB. It's just to keep that kick and sub kind of in check as it moves across. Then we'll move on to the uh, low mids. A, bit, a little bit more compression here. This is kind of where you get that boxy sound usually in your tracks. So I'm actually compressing this a little bit harder, but not too much. As you can see there, it's only getting about two dB, maybe two and a half dB of gain reduction. Um, Move to the upper frequency here, only about one and a half dBs as well. It's very non-aggressive, so it's just slight compression. As you can see, I'm doing just very small, very small changes in each one of the steps. I'm not pushing this uh, too crazy uh, because I've done a lot of the work already in the mixing stage. And then the upper frequencies. Now, if we were to come over here and grab span, you can already see it's actually looking, at least from a visual point of view, it's actually looking quite well. So we've got our kick sitting at about minus 40, 43 or something like that. And when the hi-hats kick in, 
at the moment there's no hi-hats in the, in the track, but you basically see when the hi-hats kick in, we are just under the kick, slightly. Uh, probably at around minus 47, 46 I would say. Um, there you go, so around there. So the overall balance is looking pretty good so far at this, at this moment. We can probably open this up a little bit more, so we'll continue through this. All right, so let's move on to the next component of the chain. So this is a great little clipper. It's free, as it's called the free clip. Uh, I tend to use this one or the standard clip, which is I think only like 24 bucks, which is a bargain. Um, but this clip is great, especially when you try, when you run it in oversampling uh, compared to some of the most expensive ones that are out there. Um, so if you don't know what clipping does, it is actually uh, looking at chopping some of the peaks um, of the signals, essentially allowing you to then push the mix a little bit further up when you, especially when you're going into limiters and whatnot. Um, so I'm just doing some slight clipping in here, not too much, with 4% oversampling. Now, if we were to move to the next one, now the next, uh, the next EQ, I'm actually automating this EQ uh, in the mix uh, at certain points. So what we're doing here is we have some resonant frequencies that I found, I think they were right towards the end. Let me have a look. Um, yes, they were right towards the end, I believe, of the track around here. So what I did is I literally just automated uh, this EQ to turn on towards the end when that riser is coming through. I probably could have fixed it in the mix down itself, EQ'd it a little bit better, but hey, sometimes, you know, these things get through. So what I did is just put an EQ there and just automating the EQ to turn on towards the end um, just to take care of those uh, harsh frequencies there. Um, another thing you could do, which I don't have at the moment, I've got to buy because um, I only had the demo version, is actually put a Soothe 2 in here. Um, which would actually taper and actually look after some of those harsh resonance as well. So that's a really good option as well. All right, uh, moving on. We are using our first limiter uh, in here. And this is just now to kind of bring up the volume of the overall track uh, up compared to what it was uh, before. Now, I actually mix into the limiter on my mix down sessions. Um, I've just gotten very comfortable into mixing into a limiter to kind of get a good idea of what the final sounds uh, would sound like um, things like vocals and stuff for example when you uh, push them against a limiter or a compressor um, they will more than likely sound a lot lower in the mix than what they would during the mass during the mixing process the reason is because you're actually squashing more of the signal down so um, this is why I think for me at least, uh, mixing into the uh, limiter, it's a lot easier because then I can push the volumes and get a kind of good idea of what it might sound like when it's all mastered. Otherwise, I, I, tend, I, I was finding that when I exported my mix downs and going to the mastering process, the, the vocal will be too low or the snare will be too high or the kick will be too weak. And at least this way, it gives me a good overall feeling of what that sound is going to be like when it's all kind of squashed together. So um, so that's just a little bit of prefix of what I do in the mixing process. Anyways, getting back to it. Uh, we're just running this first limiter. Um, just to bring up some of the volume. Now, I usually run this in IRC3, no clipping. But for me, uh, IRC4 and Classic actually sound pretty well. So we're not... Doing any, this clip is not really actually limiting anything, it's just really bringing up the volume here. We then run it through a second limiter. Once again, bringing up the volume. Um, this is the vintage limiter from Ozone, which I, I actually love how this bit sounds. Um, and for this, the modern algorithm actually sounds the best. And as you can see here, once again, we're just raising volume, we're not really pushing uh, any limitation down, it's very slightly, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 every now and then. And last but not least, 
the L2. Now this is a great limiter. What I'm running here is basically very slight limiting only plus the gain reduction. Of the transparent mode, which are, to me this algorithm sounds the best. And about 284 uh, milliseconds uh, attack and about 678 milliseconds release with four oversampling. Now, if you want to actually hear what the limit is doing, you can just hover off over to this area here and hit the headphones. And as you can see, it is not doing a hell of a lot. So that means I could probably push this quite a lot, a lot harder, but then I wanted this to be a little bit more dynamic. So just on that, we're getting about 6.7 lux, which is quite a loud mix. Um, and as you can see, I'm not pushing this mastering chain very hard at all. Um, so that kind of just goes to show you that if you can get your mix to a place where it's balanced correctly and your volume is balanced correctly, you've got your compression right and all that sort of stuff, you can actually get a really clean master uh, without squashing the crap out of it. So I'm not doing anything crazy. Like, I mean, I could push it harder like this. Then you start introducing a lot of artifacts and it just sounds distorted, right? So uh, for me, the sweet spot was just about two. And it's not really limiting anything here. So as you can see guys, it's a very, very simple mastering chain. Um, I'm not really doing a hell of a lot, just really attenuating some harsh frequencies, um, doing a little bit of stereo width and a little bit of clipping and uh, just a little bit of limiting. I don't even, th and some multiband compression um, just on some of those, uh, some of those frequencies there, just on the mid frequency. So to me, I found that actually if my mix is my mix down is sounding good. I don't actually have to do a lot in my master. If I start finding that I need to muck around with too many plugins to try and get the sound that I want and the final sound, I, I'd actually go back to the mix down to try and fix it there. So um, I hope this has been informative. Um, if you have any questions, please just uh, leave a comment down below and I'll try to reply to you and maybe go into it in a little bit more uh, depth. Um, explaining uh, that. I can also do another video about mix downs, maybe on this song if you want. So comment down below and let me know. Um, yeah, and this song, uh, it's not signed yet. So this is something hopefully will be out in the next I don't know, couple of months. I uh, don't know who I'm going to sign it with yet. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Don't forget to follow uh, and check out some of the other videos in the channel. Uh, don't forget to also join my Discord, which is the link should be down below. Um, and follow me on Spotify and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, all my details of my socials will be below. Until then, I'll catch you next time.